For the last couple of weeks, we've been attending to the spirituality of two poets of the early 17th century. To move onwards from them to the Jesuit priest and poet Gerard Manley Hopkins involves not simply a pole vault of 150 years, but an encounter with a very different cultural, artistic, and religious atmosphere. Our theme this evening is heaven, so I can do little better to clarify the contrast than to start by reminding you of just one stanza from George Herbert's poem, The Elixir, which we examined last time. A man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth through it pass, and then the heaven espy. Herbert was writing on the crest of one of the great ages of astronomical investigation and in the aftermath of the Copernican revolution. Dunn, for example, evokes both the Ptolemaic and the Copernican systems. His glass may be stained or clear, and it is fruitless to inquire whether his heaven with the lowercase h is God's dwelling place or merely the sky. Probably it is both. If we leap forward two centuries, however, the terms of reference and the atmosphere are of another order. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. The lines, of course, of William Blake's in the Auguries of Innocence from the Pickering Manuscript of 1807. Here it's a heaven and not heaven, and the H is capitalized. So there may be several heavens, all equally celestial. The essential point to grasp, however, is that the, is that the way to perceive them is by looking in and not looking out. Herbert and Blake are gazing in opposite directions the one into an outer, the other into an inner space. Herbert's instrument of perception is a telescope. Blake's is a microscope. Few writers were more inclined to see heaven in a wild flower than Hopkins. His journals are full of observation of flowers culled in Oxford, Surrey, Lancashire, and especially North Wales, as he trained and then practiced as a Catholic priest. In practically every case, he reads a Christian message into the practical botany. I doubt if Hopkins knew much about Blake, the Vogue, Vogue for Hume did not really take off until later in that century. The observation I'm making, however, is less, is less about influence than the kind of intellectual osmosis that yeah. operates between writers who share a cultural space. One writer whose work Hopkins definitely knew well was Wordsworth, whose ode, Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood, was published in the same year as saw the emergence of Blake's auguries. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy, and he beholds the light and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. Hopkins would have agreed about the omnipresence of heaven, though for him the capacity to perceive heaven wherever he peered lasted well into adulthood. He always responded emphatically to Wordsworth, whom he often quotes. All three poets were beneficiaries of what we like to call the Romantic movement, though I doubt that the term would have meant much to any of them. 
To look at nature for an indication of ultimate meaning was for all of them well natural. Though historically Hopkins shares much with the earlier 19th century poets, however, theologically he suffers from a dilemma to which a truer guide is his fellow priest, Herbert. To return for a moment to the elixir, the reader is invited either to admire the glass or to look through it to a divine reality that lies beyond. Supposing, however, that his eye is distracted and detained by the glass itself, what then? Herbert is proposing that the divine may be apprehended through either prayer or work. Beauty, too, may be a reflection of the divine. It does not seem to have dawned on him or troubled him that beauty might itself become the object of worship. For Hopkins, however, indebted as he was not only to romanticism, but in almost equal measure to aestheticism and to England's Roman Catholic revival, the danger and the potential for conflict between these several initiations was always present. Worship could become idolatry in the wrong hands, which is as much as to say the most sensitive hands. To see how these successive waves of influence broke across Hopkins, let's just rehearse some of the main facts and features of his life. He was born in Stratford, East London in July 1844 into a devoutly Anglican family, his father, Manley Hopkins, being a marine insurance engineer. By his second decade, the family had moved to North London, where for nine years he attended Highgate School before winning a classical exhibition to Balliol College, Oxford, then in its great period under Benjamin Jowett. Jewett had recently secured funds from the affluent Mancunian philanthropist Hannah Brackenbury to rebuild the facade of the college between Broad Street and the front quad. Not many people have found the result beautiful. Recalling the reaction of Pierre Bosquet, French commanding officer in the Crimea, to the charge of the Light Brigade, Oscar Wilde is said to have quipped concerning Balliol's spanking new facade, C'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la gare. It's magnificent, but it's not the station. <laughs> Hopkins was briefly taught by Walter Pater, doyen of the aesthetic movement at Brasenodes College down the road, despite which he gained first in both mods and greats. Pater was an indifferent teacher who once managed to lose all of the examination scripts he was marking, but the aesthetic creed that informed his work was pervasive within and beyond the university. Hopkins went walking with him in May 1866 and seems to have absorbed from him not so much a set of beliefs as a way of looking, a tendency that was reinforced by reading Ruskin, whose modern painters, with its talk of the truth of the open sky, the truth of the central mountains, the truth of the vegetation, etc., gained Hopkins' respect, much as he jibbed at Ruskin's politics. Oxford was then in the throes of the Tractarian movement, which was attempting to revitalize the Catholic roots of the Church of England. Like John Henry Newman, who had led the movement and then quitted the established church to embrace Roman Catholicism, Hopkins soon became convinced that the Tractarians did not go far enough. So in April 1866, he wrote to Newman at the oratory in Birmingham stating, I am anxious to become a Catholic. At the same time, he wrote announcing his resolve to his parents who were appalled. He was received into the Catholic Church by Newman that very year and following his graduation, began training as a Jesuit at Mendreza College, Roehampton in 1868. His training involved periods of study at Roehampton, at Stonyhurst in Lancashire, at St. Bino's in North Wales. It is from this period that a series of journal entries recount his absorption in the minute details of his natural surroundings, perhaps at its most acute in Wales, 
and his attempts to interpret the relevance of this awareness for his vocation and his faith. Entries from two successive summers, for example, attest to his passion for bluebells. The following was written in 1870 in Roehampton with a pen sketch of an English bluebell, or to give it its Latin botanical, botanical name, Endymion non scriptus. From Hopkinson's journal, June 1870. I do not think I have ever seen anything more beautiful than the bluebell I've been looking at. I know the beauty of our Lord by it. Its inscape is mixed of strength and grace like an ash tree. The head is strongly drawn over backwards and arched down like a cut water, drawing itself back from the line of the keel. The lines of the bells strike and overlie this, rayed but not symmetrically. Some lie parallel. They look steely against the paper, the shades lying between the bells and behind the cockled petal ends and nursing up the precision of their distinctiveness. The petal ends themselves being delicately lit. Then there is the straightness of the trumpets in the bells, softened by the sight in tasis and by the square splay of the mouth. One bell, the lowest, some way detached and carried on a longer forestalk, touched out with the tips of the petals, an oval not like the rest in a plane perpendicular to the axis of the bell, but a little atilt, and so with the square in rounding turns of the petal. Typical of Hopkins, is a mixture of minuscule, almost microscopic natural detail and a technical, non-botanical vocabulary, some of which he has borrowed and some of which he's made up. An entasis is the slight swelling around the girth of column-supporting buildings of the Doric order, designed to offset the convex appearance of purely perpendicular colonnades. An architectural effect of this sort, we are invited to conclude, implies the existence of a divine architect. architect. Inscape is one of two terms that Hopkins devised around this time to convey his apprehension of particular created beings. It is best described as an inner landscape, a diorama of created as essence, evident in and unique to every single creature. Along with it went instress, the principal and kinetic force impelling and inspiring each animal, plant or person. There are a couple of other terms that can help us to understand both the poetry and the prose of this period. Again, one derived, the other coined, or rather adapted. While reading in the college library, Hopkins had come across the writings of the 13th century scholastic philosopher John Duns Scotus, 1266 to 1308, who in successive sections of his dissertation, The Ordinario, had addressed himself to the question of properties of form by means of which we discern the individuality of particular things. Two principles he had felt were at work, a principle of non-divisibility and one of difference. If I strip one petal from this particular bluebell in that particular clump, it will no longer be itself nor it will, will it be so if I sub subsume it into the whole clump as taken together. It is this bluebell, not just a blue bluebell, nor is it merely a flower. To refine what he meant by this theory, Scotus had, had devised the Latin term hycitas, or thisness, which was further elaborated by his followers. It can easily be confused. It is important, for example, to distinguish between qualities that set apart this very bluebell from characteristics that all bluebells have in common. The direct designation for that, the philosophers of this school held, was quiddity or wantness. Herbert once wrote a poem called The Quiddity about what all true poems share. What makes them all poetry, or perhaps more strictly, the sort of poetry Herbert himself liked writing. Each poem of Herbert's, by contrast, might be said to possess a hycitas, a thisness, by virtue of which it was the elixir and not, say, the collar. You see what I mean. 
Hopkins was much taken with this perspective on reality, which helped him to produce some of his most effective poems, many of which address the unique splendor of individual beings or scenes. But it had a deleterious effect on his academic progress because he was coming up to his theology exams in which he seems to have written eccentrically Scottish responses to questions that required answers more along the lines of St Thomas Aquinas, the theologian whom the Jesuits regarded as definitive and orthodox. As a result, he failed to do as well as expected, probably because his answers were considered heterodox, eccentric or plain odd. Eccentricity, it has to be said, is a downside of embracing this set of beliefs. I first came across Hopkins' relationship with Scotus as a rather intense 20-year-old undergraduate reading English at university. That January, I went around to visit my godmother. I had just grown a straggly beard and started smoking Balkan Soprani cigarettes. While I was there, I decided to sample the guitars of her household. So I stared fixedly at the carpet for several minutes in order to discern the figure and coloration that rendered it unique. Then I peered intently at the clock on the mantelpiece to work out the peculiar features of its face. My godmother had started to sigh. Finally, I gazed absorbedly at the television in the corner to describe, it, to describe its unrepeatable shape and design. After 20 minutes, my godmother could stand it no longer. She pointed down at the carpet and said, carpet. She leant up towards the clock and shouted, clock. She indicated the television and yelled, television. When I returned home, I discovered her and my mother engaged in a deep and concerned conference over the telephone. Hopkins, it has to be said, also had his comic moments. He was quite a small man, and at Roehampton they couldn't find a cassock short enough to fit him. So he loped around the grounds in the wake of the other novices, occasionally tripping over the hen. As the curate of the Church of the Immaculate Conception at Farm Street in Mayfair, he once reduced the congregation to paroxysms of mirth with a sermon comparing the Blessed Virgin to a cow. Eventually, the order seemed to have concluded that pastoral work was not his forte and dispatched him to Dublin to inaugurate the chair of Greek at the newly established University College. His duties entailed mounds of marking and though as an Oxford undergraduate, he had attended debates on the Fenians at the Union and supported motions advocating home rule, in Ireland he felt excessively English, exiled and lonely. He died of typhoid fever in Dublin in June 1989, 1889 at the age of 44. His last words are reported to have been, I am so happy. But in his last years, he penned a series of sonnets expressive of deep personal dismay. Soul, self, he cries in one. Come, poor Jack, self, I do advise you, jaded, let's be. Sometimes he thought he was not in heaven at all, but in another place. A second sonnet ends with the lines, I see the luster like this and they're scourged to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. This is another term he constantly repeats, self or selves, as vernacular monosyllabic equivalents to inscape. Self or selfness recur throughout his verse. In as kingfishers catch flame, each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors each one dwells, selves goes itself, myself it seeks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. Little wonder that in his own time, Hopkins' verse and his personality were considered odd. The Jesuits rejected some of his verse when submitted to their magazine, The Month, including the magisterial wreck of the Deutschland. We only possess a body of his work at all because he set, sent it in letters to his friend Robert Bridges, who eventually became poet laureate. 
but fearful of the reaction of conservatively, conservatively minded readers, Bridges held it back for almost 30 years, only bringing out an edited selection in 1918, after which it had a transforming effect on several generations of modernist poets, from Auden to Dylan Thomas. So Hopkins became an anomaly, a mid to late Victorian poet, the arc of whose influence was delayed until the 20th century, to which its difficult style and social alienation at last appealed. Considered in terms of his own time, though, Hopkins' work and life posed problems of which he himself was only too conscious. When, for example, does self turn into self-absorption or selfishness? No wonder Hopkins found it so challenging to live in community. What were the implications of a reverence for physical beauty for a celibate priest committed to the monkish ideal of the discipline of the eyes? Sometimes, in Herbert's terms, Hopkins gazed with the glass at the heaven beyond. He was all the more troubled by those moments when his eyes stayed on the glass itself. In a poem of August 1885, To What Serves Mortal Beauty, he dwells on these difficulties. It is not his best poem, but it is among his most revealing, and you'll find it on the extra sheet. The starting moment is the episode recounted in Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, when the sixth century Pope Gregory I noticed some handsomely blonde British boys in the Forum in Rome and asked his attendants who they were. Told they were English slaves, he replied, according to Bede, non angli sed angeli, those are not angles, they're angels and promptly dispatched Augustine to establish, or more strictly re-establish, the church in England. So was Britain re-evangelized because the Pope, once upon a time, had the hots for a full English? <laughs> Hopkins himself responded to beauty in many forms, including the music of his favorite composer, Henry Purcell. But unless those beauties directed him to God, he is obliged to ask, what use did they serve? In this poem, Hopkins turns over the possibilities. To what serves mortal beauty? Dangerous. To set dancing blood the oh seal that so feature? Flung prouder form than Purcell tune lends tread to? See, it does this. Keeps warm men's wits to the things that are. What good means, but a glance master more may, than gaze, gaze out of countenance. Those lovely lads once, wet fresh windfalls of war's storm. How then should Gregory, a father, have gleaned else from swan and Rome? God to a nation dealt that day's dear chance. To man that needs would worship block or barren stone, our law says, love what our love's worthiest were all known, world's loveliest, men's selves. Self flashes off frame and face. What to do then? How meet beauty? Merely meet it, own Home at heart, heaven's sweet gift. Then leave, let that alone. Yea, wish that though, wish all. God's better beauty, grace. I think this is where we open the discussion out to the floor and get reactions. Is this, is this a poem that, that, that you know well, Hilary? Yes. Thank you. Yes. He is troubled, though, isn't he? He's troubled. He, one of the first adjectives is dangerous. Beauty is dangerous. It's seductive. It may 
it may distract one. But that's part and parcel sort of what Hawkins. If he was less troubled, he wouldn't have been as good a poet. You can see the um, scaffolding of the spiritual exercises here. Very right. Much. Okay. And so especially the first principle of foundation, which is this very almost stark utilitarian attitude to the world. That we're here to praise the reverence and serve God. And whatever helps us towards that end, we, we embrace. Whatever doesn't, we leave, we leave aside. And that, uh, that comes from here. Insofar as this leads us on to God's grace, right. modern peace is to be accepted. But the implication is that you might want to leave it alone because it doesn't actually. So things are not good in themselves. They are good insofar as they help us towards our end. So it's, it's a fleshing out, in a way, of what is as it stands in the exercises, a rather stark kind of um, catechism type answer to, to, to why we're here. It doesn't entail renunciation of beauty then. No. Well, I mean, he'd be, been used to adoration of male beauty from the Greeks, wouldn't he? So I don't think we need to sort of modernize it or turn it into something uh, too topical. But also, I mean, this idea of, uh, you know, that the absoluteness of beauty comes right the way through the 19th century from Keats, you know. Truth is beauty, beauty truth. That is all ye know on earth and all you need to know. The, the, concludes, the concluding line of Keats's Ode to a Grecian Urn. So it, it, it's not purely a fin de siècle phenomenon, but I think Francesco is quite right. I mean, he was a pupil of Pater's, and he's like almost a contemporary of Oscar Wilde's. And uh, you, you can feel the pull in two directions. Peter, I think, was not a religious man, but Wilde was. I mean, the instinct towards beauty itself is pagan, block or barren stone, as he said. But for Hopkins, it must be God-directed, otherwise it's an almighty distraction. As a disciple of aesthetics, Hopkins had long wondered what true beauty consisted of. What was the quiddity of beauty itself? While an undergraduate and still under the spell of Pater, he started writing a platonic dialogue that is set in the sumptuous gardens of New College, apparently in July 1857, a few years before he himself came up. A newly appointed professor of aesthetics, evidently Pater, is perambulating on the lawn. Enter a scholar of the college named John Hanbury, perhaps based on the author. After a while, they are joined by a stranger who seems to think he's in Worcester College. Bearing in mind the geography of Oxford, that is some mistake. It's a wonder he hasn't walked into the Oxford Canal. He tells them that he's an artist and that his name is Middlebury, and that he has recently arrived to work on the frescoes in the Library of the Union, so perhaps he's based on Rossetti. They had to start discussing the origin of beauty, which Hanbury contends is purely relative and subjective, quoting in support the old adage, de gustibis, de gustibis non est disputandum. There is no arguing in matters of taste. In an attempt to persuade them the question can be reduced to a system, the professor reaches up and plucks a spray of seven horse chestnut leaves. It is beautiful, he maintains, not because it is regular and symmetrical, since it is not. It is beautiful because, though the two sides of the spray echo one another, this symmetry is offset by the inequality in shape and size of the leaves themselves. It is the very oddness in irregularity that appeals to the mind and eye. In one of his best-known poems, Hopkins applies this rule to colour. Jenny. Pied beauty. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple colour as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire-cold chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, 
Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. I'm sure the Jesuits amongst us will recognize where the last line comes from. He's simply adapting the, the Jesuit motto, ad major, majorum glorium Dei, to the great glory of God. Um, it's justly, I think, one of Hopkins' finest and best known poems. Um, it, it, its form is unusual. It's what's known as a kirtle sonnet. Um, and as for what a, a kirtle sonnet, C U R T A L, a kirtle sonnet. In a letter to Bridges, Hopkins explained that this was a kirtle sonnet, a form that he had invented. That is, it was constructed, in Hopkins's words, in proportions resembling those of the soft sonnet proper, namely six plus four instead of eight plus six, with, however, a half-line tailpiece. So the equation is rather uh, 12 and a half, nine and a half, equals 21 and a half, equals 10 and a half. So in other words, it's a stripped down sonnet essence, in essence. And it's a form that um, Hopkins himself devised. So what we have really is an irregular sonnet praising chromatic irregularity. Is, is he arguing the theological point, do you think? I mean, God is supposed to be constant and uniform and predictable, <laughs> whereas the world that he creates is, is rife with contradiction and its beauty seems to come from the contradiction. He, is that what's troubling him? Is that what he's wondering about? I'm not sure, I, I don't see it as a concern for him. I don't no, see no, anything no. Perplexing. You know, that, 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 I just take it as a poem's straight celebration. And again, I kind of keep plotting this in terms of the exercises, but the, the, uh, at the other end of the exercises from the first bit of our nation, yeah. you have the contemplatio, this contemplation, yes. um, where God is presented as one who labors for us. Yes. And God fathers forth, and then he presents the divinity as, as um, overflowing and saturating yeah. the creation. I think the essential figure here is Ruskin, because Ruskin had a very different view of labor and industry from, you know, Brunel. <laughs> you know, um, Ruskin thought that uh, the ideal for workmanship was what went into the medieval cathedrals, where individual workmen could actually carve an individual gargoyle and could let their imagination run riot. So if you go down the line of, you know, capitals in a, in a Gothic cathedral, one that's unrestored by the Victorians, you actually see that every single gargoyle is different. That's because there was an architect, maybe a master craftsman, who directed the whole operation, but the individual operatives could do as they like. Now, there's a great deal of you know, difference between that and you know, a, a, a computer or a computer belt or what ha happened in a factory. In a factory, you get a number of identical units which are made according to a master plan. That is what Ruskin objected to, and that I think what Morris objected to, and this is what, what Hopkins objected to too. And I think all of them really want to go back to a kind of medi medieval ideal of the craft guilds where everybody had a skill which they could individually, again it gets back to the idea itself, each workman has a self and he creates an object which is an expression of his vision, not an overarching vision imposed from above by an industrialist, by somebody who's telling him what to do. Um, so I think that's what he's saying here, you know, all trades, their gear, tackle and trim. These are deliberately kind of monosyllabic, almost you know, medieval Middle English words, talking about the condition in which people actually have their individual trade and they do it as they want. So it's a Yes, he's thinking of a part of an organic community. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I mean, he did not like industrial cities, did he? He didn't particularly like working in Liverpool or anywhere like that, no. Uh, they hated the factory system, but they respected labor. I think that's what it comes down to. So, I mean, the ideal is both very 
quite conservative, but also quite communist. I, mean, I would get the impression that Ruskin and Hopkins could both have gone either way. They could either be signed the Communist Manifesto or they could have become reactionary Tories. And in, in their minds, the two ideals were completely reconcilable because they wanted to go back to what they perceived as the communal ideals of medieval workmanship. But it all had to be part, I think, of um, organic, almost medieval community. Could we then turn to the next poem? May is Mary's month, and I muse at that and wonder why. Her feasts follow reason, dated due to season, candle mass, lady day. But the lady month, May, why fasten that upon her? with a feasting in her honour? Is it only its being brighter than the most are, must delight her? Is it opportunists and flowers finds soonest? Ask of her the mighty mother. Her reply puts this other question. What is spring? Growth in everything. Flesh and fleece, fur and feather, Grass and green world all together, star-eyed, strawberry-breasted, throstle above her nested cluster of bugle blue eggs, thin forms and warms the life within, and bird and blossom swell in sod or sheath or shell. All things rising, all things sizing, Mary sees, sympathizing with that world of good, nature's motherhood. Their magnifying of each its kind with delight calls to mind how she did in her stored magnify the Lord. Well, but there was more than this. Spring's universal bliss much had much to say to offering Mary May. When drop of blood and foam dapple bloom lights the orchard apple, and thicket and thorpe are merry with silver surfed cherry. And azuring over graybell makes wood banks and breaks wash wet like lakes and magic cuckoo call caps, clears, and clinches all. This ecstasy all through mothering earth tells Mary her mirth till Christ's birth to remember and exaltation in God who was her salvation. This surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, was one of the poems that the Jesuits rejected. Um, it was when uh, Hopkins was working as a teacher in Stonyhurst College in Lancashire, and they, they were creating a, 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 a Mary garden. And all the Jesuits were in, in the school were asked to contribute something, and Hopkins contributed this poem, or suggested that this poem be read out, but they didn't want it. Um, so we might like to consider, in fact, what led to its rejection. Um, and the layering of the poem, which is more complicated than might seem at first sight. One of the best treatments of this poem actually occurs in the work of a rather anti-Catholic writer. In Alone of All Her Sex, The Myth and Cult of the Virgin Mary, Marina Warner's justly famous diatribe of 1976, she has a passage in praise of this poem, which Warner says, captures all the bursting joy of spring and its promise of fruitfulness. In lines so rich and beautiful, they stand for all that is best and happiest in the cult of the Virgin. But she goes on to point out that the cult did not exist until the 18th century. Beginning in Naples, it spread throughout Italy to Ireland and all over the Catholic world, encouraged chiefly by the Jesuits. It was all the more powerful because it drew on deep pagan roots. May being named after Maya, the Greek nymph who was the mother of Hermes by Zeus. Even today, in some places, Marian devotions may be held within the family around a May altar consisting of a table with a Marian picture decorated with May flowers. 
The family then pray together while telling the rosary. In the poem, Gerard Manning Hopkins seems to be responding to the month, to the established Catholic cult, and to the ancient reverberations. It might, in fact, be considered his only successful heterosexual love poem. Reactions. But the actual association of May with her, which seems in some ways quite arbitrary, it's something that evolved from, from the 18th century onwards. Though, as I've said, it does draw, well, it, in two directions, it draws on the Marian cult, which comes through from the early Middle Ages and before, but it also draws on these profound pagan roots. Um, just as so many pagan festivals, including Christmas, were co-opted by the Christian church. So, so May, as a, as a month of botanical and theological rejoicing, seems to come through from much older roots. But I think one can sense, a well, maybe a slight tension in the poem between those pagan roots and the theological interpretation. And I think we can see um, perhaps the reasons why the poem was less than popular with the authorities and the way that it was considered quirky. If we actually compare it with a poem that I've reproduced on your sheet, which is a poem about Mary and uh, Mary's mum, produced uh, 30 years earlier by John Henry Newman of blessed memory, who you'll see hanging on the wall. He himself wrote a celebration of May as Mary's month, which he wrote in the oratory in Birmingham in 1854. All is divine, which the highest has made, through the days that he wrought till the day when he stayed, above and below, within and around, from the center of space to its uttermost bound. In beauty surpassing, the universe smiled on the morn of its birth, like an innocent child, or like the rich bloom of some delicate flower, and the father rejoiced in the work of his power. Yet worlds brighter still, and are brighter than those, and are brighter again, he had made, had he chose, and you never could name that conceivable best to exhaust the resources the maker possessed. But I know of one work of his infinite hand, which special and singular ever must stand, so perfect, so pure, and of gifts such a store that even omnipotence ne'er shall do more. The freshness of May and the sweetness of June and the fire, the fire of July in its passionate noon, munificent August, September serene, are together no match for my glorious queen. O Mary, all months and all days are thine own. In thee lasts their joyousness when they are gone. And we give to thee May, not because it is best, because it comes first and is pledged to the rest. Well, Newman was a great church leader, um, and he produced some very nice hymns. He I kindly liked is one of my favorite, I think. But I don't think anybody would call Newman a great poet. So the question therefore arises, what makes Hopkins a good poem? <laughs> and why, why is Newman's poem less satisfactory? But I'd better ask a poet who's sitting in the front row. Yes. Not yeah. Not me. I think it's to do with Hopkins' relationship to language, surely. Yeah. I mean, Hopkins is a great linguist. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. You couldn't make this again, I don't think. No, 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 no. It's amazing, in fact, how few of Hopkins' poems have been set to music. We said about Herbert. So many of Herbert's poems have been set to music. But I once made the mistake of trying to set the wreck of the Deutschland to music. I didn't get very far. It's in the interrogative throughout Ware of Newman's. It's in, it's in the, it's an act of veneration, but it's almost in the imperative. Um, I mean, I don't think we should push the, the problem under the carpet. Hopkins did burn his poems when he joined the order. And he clearly felt that there was something worrying about the activity of being a poet while being a Jesuit. He obviously felt there was a contradiction. It may not seem to us there's a contradiction, but it appeared to him that there was a contradiction. 
Eventually, he got round, round to writing poets again in 1870, but he, he, di he didn't spread them around much, and he didn't think he read them much to his fellow Jesuits, and he sent them in letters to Robert Bridges. I think he would be absolutely amazed to know that this lecture was taking place this evening. But he probably, he probably thought when he sent them in letters to Bridges, that that, that was the end of the matter. It's to thank the Bridges, in fact, it, that the poems were rescued, and he, he's recognized as being the great poet that he is. But clearly, Hopkins felt that there was something, not in Bridig, but there was something that pulled against his vocation, yeah. being a poet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they rejected the main benefit of that, then in that sense, rejected it. Then, um, well, it must have been a jolt, but I mean, I don't think he was surprised well, or no, scandalized, not but... Surprised. I mean, I, I think he thought that his poetry questioned things, and he, I think he thought that that questioning itself was worrying, that as a, as a Jesuit he should be accepting things and not questioning them. Well, I think he does, and I think he's very thankful for it, but, you know, in his later sonnets, he seems very distressed by the isolation which results from this. You know, poor Jack Self, you know, he was very, very hard on himself, and I think he did suffer very markedly from feelings of self-recrimination and guilt and self-reproach. Um, well, do you think... Uh, no, no, I'm not doing carrying come, but, but can you talk a bit about the poem, is, if it's one of your favourites? But the, the, these below, the late period when he went to Ireland, he did feel intensely isolated for a lot of different reasons. I mean, he was an English person in Ireland. I think he actually approved of Home Rule. But he felt very alien and, and uh, alien, I mean, and, and, and isolated even, I think, within the Jesuit order in Ireland. He hated his job, which was marking scripts by and large. Um, he didn't feel it was creative at all, and he felt it was, he, he was going so, nowhere. And I think he was distressed by his own distress, because he should have been thankful, but he felt profound, I think profoundly depressed, actually. And this, this selfhood, the, which is a source of praise in the early poems, seems to turn inward and become rancid. So these are the mountains of distress that somebody has to overcome. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very good uh, prompt, actually, for the next poem, which is God's Grandeur which is a poem about the deep beauty that lies beneath the surface of things. Um. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the back black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with our bright wind. I think this is probably my favourite um, Hopkins poem. In fact, I've asked for a, a sentence from it to be put on my tombstone. That's all. <laughs> it was sent as a birthday present to his mother in April 1877. In it, heaven does seem to be internalised. It lies deep down beneath nature's surface and probably, and probably deep down in all of us as well just as hell does. Um, but that problem that we were looking at earlier about you know, the trades and the world of man and the world of nature um, seems to strike a different relationship here. Why, does, why do men therefore not wreck his rod? There seems to be a tension in the poem between human activity, what humans have created, and this dearest freshness which belongs to the domain of nature. Um, comments on this poem? Well, to me, it echoes the, the line in Thomas Scotus' Oxford about the base of Brickish. The base of Brickish, uh, presumably, is Jericho, is it? The imagery is interesting, isn't it? It will, it will flame out like lightning from shook foil, rather like static electricity, which comes from within something. 
It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. He's either referring to, I think, an olive oil press or a linseed oil press. So again, it comes from within. Crushed beauty. As if God is the juice of the world, as it were. Somebody asked a question when we were talking about sonnets and done, about the turn in the sonnets. Uh, often in sonnets there is a turn. It's often it's between the octave and the sestet, where the thought suddenly goes off in a, in, a, in a different direction. It seems to me that in a lot of Hopkins' poems, actually, the turn comes quite close to the end. Because, as in Pied Beauty, I mean the theological wash, praise him, uh, comes very close to the end. Often it seems to me that the last line is underlying a, a theological interpretation, which perhaps is only implicit in the body of the poem. What do you expect to say about the wind hopper? Yeah. Which well, the wind hopper is coming next. Yes. The fact is dedicated to Christ our Lord. Yeah. There's nothing within the poem itself to suggest that. There is in the last line. Okay. <laughs> so, Hilary, would you like to read the wind hover? To Christ our Lord. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dappled dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute, beauty and valour and act. O oh, air, pride, plume, here buckle. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plough down silly and shine, and blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. And I think everybody responds to this. I, I was teaching it earlier in the week to somebody who was an avid atheist, and he said it's one of the finest poems he'd ever read. Um, it appeals to everybody, I think. A lot of different ways into it. I suppose, well, just one very simple question. Ah, oh, my dear, in the last but one line, whom is he addressing? The poem is a prayer. I mean, Michael said there wasn't a reference to Christ in the body of the poem, just in the subtitle. Ah, my dear, is that directed to God? And is it... So he's talking to Christ and saying, I, had, I saw a kestrel, it is a kestrel, uh, an illustration of a kestrel, in fact, in your booklet, so you can see. Kestrels are, well, they're called wind hobbers, I think, because they, they ride the airwaves and then they suddenly swoop and they dart. Um, about this time last year, I was in Cornwall in a bay, and I was in a house actually called the Wind Hover, and there were kestrels um, surging above. So you could observe this motion of riding the, the waves and then suddenly swooping down. And I think the movement of the kestrel is perfectly caught in the verse. So you think the poem is a prayer? Yes. Though it begins more like a journal entry, doesn't it, actually? It begins rather like those journal entries in prose, and then it suddenly goes into this great ecstatic poem. And there is a break. I mean, but the break, I think, comes, or maybe it's more between the octave and the sestet here, brute beauty and valor and act of pride bloom here, buckle, and, I, I mean, that's capitalised. I don't know, don't know whether one could read it. And the fire that breaks from then, a billion times more lovely, more dangerous. Oh, my chevalier. The chevalier is the kestrel, presumably. Christ. Right, OK. But the bird has become Christ by that 
points, do you think? Why is it dangerous? Well, this was the word I was... Because we met the word dangerous, didn't we, earlier on, into what serves mortal, mortal beauty. And there, the dangerous meant that by concentrating on the beauty, the danger is that you're distracted from God. Is that what it means here, or does it mean something different? Yes. Yeah. Yes. More lovely, more dangerous than what than the kestrel, which is a yes. sort of thing. Yes. Indeed, or, indeed. Yeah, this is the kestrel, it's more lovely and dangerous yeah. than Hopkins. Or, I mean, he's saying that yeah. Christ is even more lovely yeah. than the bird. I think that's yes. The word. But also more dangerous. Yeah. So why is Christ more dangerous than the bird? Because following him makes immense demands. Um, I think the image of Christ. <coughs> Yeah. of God the Father is yeah. an old one, you find it in the Middle Ages yes. in things like the Corpus Christi Carol yes, um, yes the image at the end of is a, of a plowshare, the friction of the plowshare against the side of the, of the runnel actually causes it to shine and the, the final image of course is of what something maybe Hopkins himself has done, which is actually banking down a fire and you rake out the ashes and as you do so, suddenly there's this flash of luminosity from within, which is precisely what the, what the bird, what the chevalier has, has yielded in this moment of exposure. And I suppose that the theological thought is that by sacrificing himself on the cross, by humbling himself, by buckling, Christ unleashed this tide of salvation which is transformative, but also, to use that word, dangerous, to us as, w as well as to him. It's closer to Herbert than to the Romantics. It's rather turning the Romantics on their head. I mean, the, the Romantics, rather like the West Wind, I mean, they like gush, you know, like energy. They did not like, I suppose, restraint. And this poem is about the beauty that comes from restraint. This bird is beautiful, not only because it is magnificent, but because it's disciplined. It's got the discipline of a bird of prey, just as Christ has. And it's a discipline that we as worshippers, and in his case Jesuit, should follow. I think he takes a very risky poet, Hopkins, in, risky in all kinds of ways, to write a poem in praise of sheer plot. And to, to risk a rhyme like, my heart in, uh, in hiding stirred for a bird. Now, I, I, I wouldn't like to use that rhyme, but he gets away with it. Yes. There's a lot of internal rhyming going on, apart from anything else. I love the image of skating, too. Then off, off, forth on swim, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow band. It's incredibly graphic and kinetic. So maybe we should come back to our theme of heaven. Uh, it seems to me that for Hopkins, heaven was as much within as outside. He wasn't looking outside so much, he was looking to nature. He actually thought his, his theology, to use a technical term, was a theology of imminence rather than transcendence. You have the occasional transcendent image as of the dove's bright wings, but mostly the theology is profoundly imminent, and that seems to me tunes in both with his um, romanticism and with his aestheticism. Finally, I think he does manage to reconcile these twin impulses, though it seems to have been a struggle sometimes. Thank you very much. <laughs>